Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the second edition of uh, Bridges of Belonging. So looking forward to this conversation today. Um, I do just want to start by doing a territory acknowledgement. So I live in Victoria and I am very grateful to be on Coast Salish territory, especially over the um, last few weeks where um, we've been here kind of constantly and uh, just really appreciating the stewardship and um, uh, with great gratitude that the Coast Salish people of the Esquimalt and Songhees nations have taken such great care of these lands for us over time so that we have a safe place to be right now. Um, so just wanted to start off with that and then um, just in terms of protocol today on Zoom we'll ask um, everyone except the speakers to both mute and turn off your cameras and um, as we get later in the presentation and there's an opportunity for questions and answers, um, I encourage you to ask questions that way. You can also post questions in the chat box throughout the session. And um, then I also just wanted to note that uh, we are recording this session. So by joining us, um, you are gonna be part of this recording. So I know you acknowledge that in your registration, but just wanna make sure everyone's clear on that. And if you um, don't want to show up in the recording, then you can, either uh, erase your name or and or don't put your camera on at any point. So um, just a welcome to uh, this session and uh, really excited to have folks join us today. And um, I know that people are kind of wrapping their head around what these conversations are about, but to me it's just an opportunity to really bring folks together that are really doing some incredible work and who I really admire and respect and to share their journeys and belonging and to kind of elevate the diversity and inclusion conversation to how do we connect with people and support people in what they're doing um, and what they need to be successful in the spaces and places so that they can thrive. So I'd like to kick off the sessions with a uh, quote or a poem and so today um, partially in honor of the connection that Karen brings with uh, the work she's done around the Obama um, gender equity change makers I thought I'd quote Michelle Obama's book Becoming because uh, there was just so many great pieces in that and so I'm going to kick off with this one let's invite one another in Maybe we can begin to fear less, to make fewer wrong assumptions, to let go of the biases and stereotypes that make that unnecessarily divide us. Maybe we can better embrace the ways we are the same. It's not about being perfect. It's not about where you get yourself in the end. There's power in allowing yourself to be known and heard, in owning your own unique story, in using your authentic voice. And there's grace in being willing to know and hear others. This for me is how we become. So with that, I do want to introduce our two guests today. And um, David and I have known each other for many years, I think around 10 years. And Karen and I have just started to get to know each other. So it's a really interesting uh, dichotomy there in terms of our relationships and where we're at in that journey of our relationships. Um, Dr. David Legg is a professor in the Department of Health and Physical Education at Mount Royal University in Calgary. He was named the top 40 under 40 a couple years back and um, <laughs> <laughs> spends his time, his volunteer time. He was the um, president of the Canadian Paralympic Committee and is a past board member for the 2015 uh, Pan Para Pan American Games in Toronto. He's also served on the International Paralympic Committee and their Sports Sciences Committee and is currently the president of the International Federation of Adaptive Physical Activity. Karen Craggs Milne is the founder of Conscious Equality, which is a diversity and inclusion consulting agency. She's a proud Canyon Canadian and is recognized as a global expert with over 20 years of international experience promoting equity, diversity, equality, and inclusion. She's an Obama White House recognized gender equality change maker and a global goodwill ambassador for sustainable development goals. So a lot of pieces that are near and dear to my heart from both of you. So I'm going to turn it over to David to kick us off. I'm going to get rid of this background slide so that we can really focus on our two speakers. So over to you, David, and I will just stop sharing the slide right now. Well, first of all, thank you, Andrea, for inviting me. Uh, 
Auntie, is it your show? Like, are you like Ellen now? Is this like your show? Yeah, uh, that's my thing. I'm going to be Ellen next. Yeah. So I, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm honored. I'm, uh, I'm grateful to have been given this platform and this opportunity to have a conversation with you. So thank you. Thank you for thinking of me. Thank you for the invitation. Um, do you want me just to, I think you had asked me just to talk a little bit about kind of who I am and my background. Uh, so I'm a, I mean, it's, it's funny, you think, like, how do you describe who you are? And, you know, a lot of people probably go through a chronology of, you know, I w grew up here, I went to school here, and, you know, I, and I guess another way of doing it is just the roles, you know, the roles that you play. Um, you know, father, son, brother, husband, I don't know. Then you think about, you know, the, the professional roles that you play. Uh, you know, I see Stephen Burks on the line here. I mean, you know, I, a friend, I guess, could be another, you know, category of how you describe yourself. Um, so I guess, you know, kind of trying to weave all those things together. I have, you know, I, I probably the foundational things about who I am is I'm interested in sport, recreation, physical activity. I think those are kind of core things that have woven certainly throughout uh, my life. I like to think that I have strong kind of connection to family, whether it's, you know, as a son, uh, growing up in a family where a father had a disability. So my dad had multiple sclerosis and was pretty much immobile. And so my sister and I would take turns, you know, toileting and feeding my dad. So I, I grew up in a family where and my mom was a home economist um, and a high school teacher. And so I, you know, I grew up in a, a probably a fairly traditional, you know, middle class, uh, family in the Niagara region and in Ontario, just near Buffalo and Hamilton. Um, and then I would say the other kind of foundational thing is a kind of a deep, uh, abiding, uh, sense of, I don't know, social justice, um, fairness, equity, uh, diversity and all those sorts of things. I, 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 I hesitate to say that I'm an expert on it, but I, I certainly think I have an interest in it. Um, and it's something that I certainly continue to try and learn more about and understand, you know, even, you know, your land acknowledgement at the start of your, uh, of this session today, Andrea, and, and I had you on um, a session last week that I convened and I didn't do a land acknowledgement. Um, and, you know, the session was on belonging, diversity and inclusion. And it's not something that I think comes naturally to me and something that I have to be perhaps a bit more, uh, thoughtful about. Um, and so again, I, I hesitate to say that I'm an expert on it and that I do it perfectly, but I'm certainly interested in it and I'm trying to, trying to get better. So there you go. That's me. That's who I am. Super. Thank you. Um, that was a great introduction. And uh, I know that I have lots of questions we're going to work through as we go through this conversation today, but I'm going to turn it over to Karen to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your journey, Karen. Thank you, and uh, I apologize for the neighbors who are mowing their lawn right now. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you can hear it, but that's real life, and that's part of working from home. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, one of the things that, you know, crossed my mind as I was listening to your introduction is you're also a white guy who's talking about equity and diversity and inclusion, and that is so important to this work, is being able to embody and create space for that variety of voices and to break down you know, who gets permission to talk about privilege and oppression and what that looks like and whose experience of it is more valid than others, right? And so, you know, I'm always on the lookout for, some people will call them allies, some people will call them accomplices, but I'm always on the lookout for creating space for all those different perspectives and roles and voices in this work. And, uh, you know, to connect that back to who I am and what I do, uh, so I'm Karen. I'm very proud to be Kenyan Canadian. I was born and raised in Kenya, which is in East Africa. And I moved to Canada 20 years ago to do my undergrad degree and ended up building a life here. But uh, first and foremost, I'm, you know, African by birth, African in terms of most of the lessons I learned in my life around belonging and equity and diversity. And it's very much a part of an identity that I'm very proud of. And so I love when I go in a cab, you know, whether it's in Yellowknife or Toronto and I'm, you know, talking to someone and I can tell they're from Ethiopia and they're from Ghana and they're from Cameroon and they say, 
how do you know you you know and then i say well where do you think i'm from and they're like are you indigenous are you latin american like the last thing they would think of is that i have african roots and background and i love that because it challenges you know our assumptions and embedded stereotypes around what does it mean to be african like yesterday was world you know celebrating africa day and uh one of the posts that i'm going to be putting out is you know why do we feel that you have to be black skinned and have a certain kind of hair and and story to tell in order to be african right so i'm all about blowing those things up <laughs> and so i guess i would say that you know my raison d'etre in life is really to 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 um first of all acknowledge that we live in a world that is built on stereotypes that is built on boxes that we need to fit in and that we go through a process through socialization of being rewarded and penalized for fitting in so you know your identity and the process that you go through in life to create who you are is very much about you know almost like writing bumper cars where you're trying to figure out how do i not get bumped next time right and you become smaller and smaller and smaller as a human being in order to fit in spaces that validate your experience and that validate your identity for me growing up that was very difficult because i had a brown mother you know who was gujarati and strict vegetarian and i had a white father who came from the colonial england uh, that no longer exists but that had a steakhouse and you know so they had different religions they had different eating habits they had different values and then i had a brother who was black who was seven years older than me and you know it was just like how do i create how do i figure out who i am in this very mixed world where i'm getting contradictory messages about what's acceptable about whose values matter more about where i fit in or don't fit in and so this conversation is very dear to me and it has been what i have done for the last 20 years and what i will do till my dying day is creating space for people to show up and own their story and own who they are and be able to not only own it but also impact the world in the process I'm just going to stop there, but that's, that's, yeah, I'm a badass and I like to challenge, challenge the narrative and challenge the way, you know, I don't want people to be comfortable around this because it's not comfortable work. Well, I love that. You're a badass. That's a great way to kick us off today. Can't think of a better way, actually. <laughs> so let's all be badasses together today and uh, talk about some of these pieces. So um, Karen, I really appreciated the comment about uh, people being rewarded and penalized for fitting in. I think that's a really powerful statement. And, um, you know, in some of the work that I'm doing right now, we're talking about fitting in actually being the opposite of belonging. So how do we sort of challenge those pieces around like what fitting in looks like, what belonging looks like? How do we create the connection so people can belong with who, and who they are and how they show up? You want me to go first? <laughs> okay, okay. So for me, a couple of things come into play when I when I'm helping people experience belonging or you know creating more inclusive organizations, which is a big part of my work. And so the first is celebrating difference. So not you know going out of your way to actually celebrate everybody's differences and to validate that their experience and perspective is valid, and they don't need somebody else's permission. To, to say what they say or to experience what they experience. Like I've had white men say to me, I'm like throwing my hands up. I don't know what to do anymore. If I open the door, I get yelled at by a woman. If I close the door, I get yelled at. Like if I don't do anything, I get yelled at. And it's like, that is a very valid experience for somebody to go through in a, in a post-feminist world where we're trying to figure out what everybody's roles are. So part of belonging is to create the space for people to tell their truth exactly as it is and to, to, to hold them in that space and then to create, um, you know, dialogue around. Okay, what does this mean? You know, if if your experience is, is valid and my experience is valid and it's very different, like where's the space in between for us to to build relationship and to build empathy and and support for each other? David, what about you? What are your I, thoughts on it? Yeah, I think within the uh, you know within a specific context of my world in, insofar as teaching at a university and teaching adapted physical activity. So of course it's designed to talk about sport, physical activity, recreation for people with disabilities. And I think, I, I mean, I've been doing it for almost 25 years. So I think I've evolved. I, I don't know if I've gotten necessarily better at it, but I've definitely 
changed in my approach. Even the language that we use, and so to kind of Karen's point, I find students, and the vast majority of the students within the class will be, you know, from a fairly narrow demographic. Um, first of all, you know, 98% of them are able-bodied, that I'm aware of anyways. Um, they typically are from a fairly narrow socioeconomic background and, you know, kind of a very traditional upbringing. And I find that they'll, uh, they'll speak about disability in couched ways. They just they're, are anxious about saying the wrong thing. Um, they're nervous about being portrayed or presented in a negative way. And so the, the, the default then is to say nothing um, and to do nothing. I, and I find that anyways, or there will be a few that will be quite vocal and, and, and willing to share, but again, not necessarily in, in my opinion, in appropriate ways. And so I find I, I try to walk a bit of a balance almost insofar as not being punitive or not being, uh, not pushing too hard back initially. What I try to do is find openings to talk about appropriate language. And again, this is only based on my opinion too, because there's even within how we talk about disability, there's a variety of perspectives. Um, and a, a complete range of opinions on what appropriate terminology is or how to speak or how not to speak. And so I, I, I think I've, I've become more patient in my approach and my willingness to let people almost kind of work through it themselves with some guidance um, from me. And I think it's similar to, you know, to, to Karen's comment about, you know, that, and again, I, I fit within that demographic, the stale male and pale. Um, you know, so I, but I think, I, I think that's the right way to do it, at least based on my understanding at the moment, is to be patient, to guide, to question, to challenge, to, you know, ask about, you know, hidden biases and, um, and just to kind of check, you know, perspectives, but not be forced, because then I think what that does is it pushes people the other way. Um, from that sense, then, you know, to, to your question earlier, about kind of that belonging and feeling part of a, of, of, of a group. And within that, David, um, in terms of sort of the role you can play as an ally, a champion, a conversation starter, an influencer, I mean, you've played that role extensively in the disability space, but, you know, as we talked about at the beginning, sort of recognizing other roles you can play, whether it's, um, you know, acknowledging a territory and some of the work you're doing or connecting to work that others are doing to help elevate them like how do you navigate some of those roles well I, I mean i think some of the basic tenements of leadership are always the modeling the behaviors and model you know modeling the way uh, modeling the behaviors that you want others to to follow i mean i so if i think of my role as a father um i think it's imperative if i you know i have three sons and so I think about how I interact with my wife, um, how I interact with our neighbors, um, because they you know, they may not be, uh, they may not be watching me intently, but I know they're, I know they're paying attention, or I, I know they're observing, um, whether it's focused or not, and they pick up on cues, they pick up on little tendencies, and so I, I think it's the same way as a, as a teacher, um, you know, with my students, the, the behaviors that I model. Uh, for them are the ones that I want and hope that they themselves uh, will pick up on. So I think to me, that's, that's the biggest one. I, I mean, I think back to, you know, my role with the Pan and Para Pan American Games and, you know, th and that's where you and I first met each other, right, Andrew? It was when I was on the board of the Canadian Paralympic Committee and, you know, as the representative at that time of the Canadian Paralympic Committee on that board. I mean, in, like, it was interesting because, you know, in some respects, the expectation was is that I was the one who spoke on behalf of disability for the entire Pan and Para Pan American Games, and I kept trying to model the behavior of no, 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 no. We're all board members of the Pan and Para Pan American Games. We all have a role to play in this. It's not, you know, just because I'm the representative of something, um, it's my job. And I even the language that we use again, I tried not to be punitive when people just said Pan American Games, but I did try to remind people, no, it's Pan Para Pan American Games. And I try to make almost a sing-song joke of it. Let's all say it together, um, you know, five times so that we can get used to saying 
the, you know, the terminology. So I think the modeling of the behavior where I have, you know, some, I, I, I'm just not sure what the right approach is. It's just how firm to go and how hard to push and when to pull back. And I, I just think that's sometimes a personal preference and it's probably context specific, but I certainly have not come across, you know, like a one size fits all. This is how you, you know, you make behavioral change. And Karen, what about you? Since we've gone down the track of sort of behavioral change and language, like, um, you know, you kicked off with uh, some strong language about your approach. So tell us a little bit about that and how that plays out for you and sharing your lived experience. And again, sort of being an ally and champion for um, different topics around diversity and inclusion, belonging. So yes, what's a badass approach to doing this work? <laughs> So I think the, the first thing is to, you know, turn the lens inward and to do the work you need to do with yourself, because all of us have wounds that we need to heal around our story, our experience of oppression, etc. So, you know, um, yeah, like turn that lens inward and do that work for yourself. I've been doing it, I would say, since I was eight, I've been really, really intentionally trying to understand social dynamics, trying to understand what scenarios create empowerment and you know what scenarios take the same person with the same features and you know disempower them and what does that look like and how what role can I play how can I uh, how can I help people in this process so my specific because um, you can play many different roles and my gift I think in this work is to teach people so I create safe spaces and I teach them and one of the ways that I teach is through my story and it's not a story, it's multiple stories, and each one of those stories has a lesson embedded in it. Because I feel like people don't understand that when it comes to training, we don't learn through words. We learn through images, we learn through emotional connections with each other, to, you know, coming back to, um, you know, knowing what it felt like to be in that situation that somebody else just described. So a lot of what I do is connecting those dots after having done the work for myself. And I have to say that, you know, there are times when, you know, you have to adjust the way you deal with people and meet them where they are. So some people are really hungry for this work and they're just like, teach me, I want to know, what don't I know about this? How can I do this better? What does that look like? And then there are others who are part of an organizational setting, for example, where the organization has a particular mandate, they want to go in a certain direction, but there are individuals who just are not ready for it or actively don't want to be part of it. In fact, they may be undermining the work. And uh, you know, one of the things about my approach is that I want to have that conversation. I want to find that person and I want to sit down and talk to you about what your concerns are, what is it that you're seeing that we're not seeing, and how can I understand where you're coming from so that I can unblock what's blocked. Because one thing we don't understand around re resistance is that when somebody's expressing resistance, either outwardly or inwardly, what they're doing is saying that they actually care about what the issue is. They have a stake in it, but it's just that we don't want to hear them because they don't fit in our agenda. Or, you know, they, they make us uncomfortable because their perspective doesn't, um, doesn't make it easy for all of us to move forward. So, you know, I, I'm embracing those people. I want to hear about them. And a good group that I've worked with for a long time that has helped me develop these skills is offenders of sexual harassment. So I've gone into organizations where somebody has offended. There's no doubt that what they did was, you know, either a little bad or super, super bad. And people write them off. They want to walk away from them and they want to just say, you know what, we don't want anything to do with you. But it's in partnering with those individuals that I've learned the most about how to help and support communities and societies and organizations around the Me Too issue. And so they teach me as much as I teach them. But the bottom line, I think, is that we, you know, we can, we can only be as good in this work as those people are in struggling through what they're dealing with. And so, you know, I really believe that you cannot move forward with only the people who want to and leave behind those who are struggling or who don't want to be part of it. Because ultimately, we all have a, a thread that connects us and it's about us getting, it's about getting us back to that thread. And so a lot of what I do is, is really heart-centered work that helps people, you know, feel valued, acknowledged, heard, and then, and then we build from there and we build together. 
Unbelievable answer, Karen. Thank you. That uh, is so generous in your approach and how you um, approach your work and bringing those in that um, mm -hmm. need the work arguably the most as we go forward and so that we can learn from their lived experience and um, both good and bad in that. So I'm going to pivot a little bit because um, Karen, what you just kind of uh, finished off with around sort of the connection piece, I want to come back to how is it that for each of you, you felt like times when you belonged and what facilitated that feeling and um, kind of the, that way forward for you? So I'm going to get Karen to lead off on that. Oh, <clears throat> so like a memory of when I felt like I belonged? A memory or, you know, sort of what, what do you know you need in order to feel like you belong in different situations? You know, obviously you came yeah. to a new country um, at some point during your journey, which I'm sure there was a whole raft of learnings of belonging around that. Oh my gosh. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. So when, I, so when I first came to Canada, you know, everybody thinks Canada is this amazing country where dreams come true. And I always used to say, hashtag <laughs> false advertising. Because that was not my initial experience. I went to university and I was on campus and uh, I remember we had to write things about ourselves on our dorm door. And so it was like a blank sheet of paper and write, who is Karen? So that someone who's knocking on your door for the first time has a sense of who you are. And you know, I wrote proud Kenyan, whatever, whatever. And then people would knock on my door and they'd say, wait a minute, isn't Kenya in the US? Like, <laughs> you know, just like, seriously, you didn't even do the work to figure out which, like where my country is located. But then it got worse because then as soon as I said I'm from Africa, they'd say, you speak English really well. Like you don't even have to, how did that happen? And I thought this is happening in Canada with Canadians. Like, you know, it really blew my mind. And so there was, um, there was some struggle around belonging because, because I felt like people weren't doing the work to even meet me where I am. Right. It's like I had to educate them on what it means to be Kenya. I had to educate them on the fact that we had a colonial history and we speak English really well. You know? And so uh, part of it was frustrating. And actually, over time, it made me very angry. It made me angry because I became very aware of this um, unfair entitlement that people had, which was I'll go around seeing the world the way I see it. And if you want me to know better, it's your job to get me to that place. Right. And so um, what changed for me over in the same kind of institutional setting, what changed over me in, uh, for me in the second, third and fourth year was when I started um, just being me and not taking every opportunity that came to me to, to feel like I was responsible for educating everybody. So I just stopped apologizing for being me and I stopped feeling like I had to educate everyone at the same time because it was exhausting. Uh, but the, the real piece, I think, which, which we've hit on in the questions that you sent us was this piece around like the self work. And so, you know, one thing that happened to me before I came to Canada was when I was 13, I was raped. And I don't want to go into all of that details because not a lot of people are expecting me to be that honest, but I do talk about it. And the whole experience around that was <clears throat> that you know, you experience what the world expects you to experience in a situation like that. So it's like, oh my gosh, that happened to you. You're a victim. I'm so sorry for you. You know, you know, it's not your fault. Like all of these stereotypical things happen. But the thing that made me belong in this new university setting where, you know, sexuality is expressed and experimentation is open and everybody, oh you know, like the thing that helped me feel like I belong was when I owned what happened to yeah, me. Go ahead that it, I didn't let it um, poison new interactions with new people, you know, if that makes any sense. So, so that was a big piece because university is all about sexual self-expression and identity and all of that. And it was just like, hey, this happened. It's a part of who I am. It's a part of my story. It's why I need deep, meaningful connection before you can have a one night stand with me. And at the same time, you know, we can do that too, right? <laughs> but yeah, like, you know, that's, so I think it was connecting with my own story and creating boundaries that, that were healthy for me and not apologizing for that. Excellent, some uh, really key pieces there. And thank you for uh, sharing your story. So honestly, I know that uh, many people will appreciate that vulnerability that you're sharing with us today, so. 
Um, David, over to you to talk a little bit about sort of your journey and belonging and um, what that's looked and felt like for you. I, I have, so you, I mean, you sent the, you sent that question to me in advance. I've really struggled uh, with trying to think about how I was going to answer that question. I, I have to be honest that this, I, I still don't really know um, how I'm going to respond. I, and I was, I, I was, I was trying to think about where have I felt that I belonged? Where have I felt comfortable? Where have I felt uh, part of a community? And there have been a couple and, and, you know, certainly the Canadian Paralympic movement is one. Um, and, you know, people like you and Stephen Burke, I think are part of that. What I, what I had a harder time trying to figure out was why, um, why I felt I belonged there and why I felt uh, part of, of a group. Um, and I see Mark, um, Mark is on the call too. I, I, tur I, tur oh, I can, I still don't know how to say your last name, Mark. I apologize. I know it's Spanish. Um, but Mark, Mark does work. So I, I always feel like I belong at my place of work, uh, at Mount Royal university. Um, <laughs> I I, uh, whatever. Sorry, Mark, I'm working on it. Um, and he, 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 when he was working at campus recreation at Mount Royal, I mean, I think that was a big part of his goal and role was to make people feel like they belonged there through campus recreation. And, and I felt that, um, but I don't know kind of the how part of it. And then the last one that I thought of, and I still feel this way when I go home, home uh, to where I grew up um, in St. Catharines and it's a very even a specific part of St. Catharines, it's the south end, you know, it's probably about a five kilometer radius from where I, you know, the house that I grew up in with my parents. I still feel like I belong there when I go home. Um, and, you know, now a number of my parents, my father has already passed away and a number of my mom's peer group are, you know, are at the age where a number of them are, are, are passing on. And so there's fewer and fewer of my parents' social group that are still there. But I, when I go home, um, and it's funny, I still, I mean, I've been living in Calgary for, you know, 25 years, and I still refer to home as, you know, St. Catharines, I get that sense of belonging still. There are people that care about me and uh, people that, you know, remember me and, and that kind of foundational time in my life. And so, and again, I'm not really sure why that's what came to me when you said, where do I feel belonging? But those are the three examples that I came up with um, that came to me right away. The how and the why part I have yet to kind of figure out. Interesting you mentioned the Paralympic Committee because I often reflect on, you know, 10 years ago I went to my first Paralympic meeting running for the board. I knew no one. I knew very little about the Paralympic movement or sports. I didn't know really who any of the athletes were. But uh, you know, it was this really welcoming group and right away I felt really at home and people just sort of pulled me into their circles and, you know, mm. were interested in learning about me and created connection with me right out of the gate. And I've always been so grateful for that experience because that hasn't been my experience in a lot of the other sports circles. Mm. I often described it as sport without the ego, <laughs> as one piece. but also, um, you know, as I kind of reflect on that, it's also, you know, and this is what I hope I'm helping facilitate in the diversity inclusion work I continue to do with the Paralympic Committee is, you know, how do we just create really welcoming spaces where people feel safe to show up as they are and to, um, you know, make sure we're addressing any challenges and barriers to that being the case. So, you know, it's just uh, interesting that we've sort of had that shared experience of the Paralympic movement. So I'm going to flip the dialogue to a time when you didn't feel like you belonged and what that felt like and how that showed up for you. So David, we'll start that question with you. Um, the one example that came to mind straight away is, um, I had an opportunity to live in uh, Halifax for a year um, while teaching at Dalhousie University on a sabbatical. And, and it, I, I don't want to sound disrespectful to the people of Halifax um, or the province of Nova Scotia, but the term that was, we, we were called CFAs, come from ways. Um, and that it was all, it was pretty much said to us that, that we would never 
we would never be recognized as belonging uh, there unless we were kind of fifth generation. Um, and it was funny, and now I don't know if it was because I was told that, that then I saw things through that lens or whether or not it was actually true. But I did feel that way. I never felt um, as if I fully belonged to that campus or to that community. I felt like a visitor um, and that I was not, I don't say I wasn't welcomed. Like, I, like there was nothing that was overt um, or mean spirited that I, you know, picked up on. But I never, I did not feel like I belonged. Um, and, and yet when I moved, when we did a similar trip to Melbourne, um, for whatever reason, the, the neighborhood that we lived in there, we were um, embraced. Now, maybe again, it's, it's circumstance and context and our kids were of an age where they were playing community sport. And so we got to know other families that way. And maybe it was, you know, my wife and I having younger kids when we were in Halifax. So we weren't necessarily as, you know, perhaps, uh, I don't say aggressive, but um, willing to get out and be social. And in Melbourne, our kids were a bit older and playing you know, sports where we could interact with other families. So maybe it's just that circumstance, but it was definitely a difference between the two. Um, and so I, I've, I've always re recalled on or recollected that difference. And when we came back to Canada after our year in Melbourne, the neighborhood that we lived in in Calgary, we didn't feel like we belonged anymore. Um, and I was never quite able to put a finger on that as to why we felt that way. And ultimately that was how we ended up moving to Cochrane. Um, and I saw that Leah Weens was on this call. Uh, we, we, we desperately wanted that sense of community. Like we were absolutely yearning for it um, just within our small confines of the city. And so when we moved to Cochrane, we, we felt that almost immediately. Uh, and again, I, I, I struggle with trying to figure out the, the specifics as to what led to that. But it certainly was something that both my wife and I have acknowledged that we felt and have embraced and, and certainly enjoyed. Thank you very much for that answer. Karen, what about you? What about a time that uh, you didn't feel you belonged and uh, sort of how did that transpire for you? Uh, so one thing that comes to mind is when I was younger. So as I said, my mom is, you know, Gujarati Indian and my father is white from England and his whole family was in England, but we were growing up in Kenya and I had all my Indian family around me. And so, and I actually lived with my grandparents for a while in the extended family. So I went to religious school like everybody else did. I learned the language. I learned to read and write Gujarati. We watched Hindi movies every night. Like I grew up in this extended family network where uh, you know, I thought I was one of them, right? And then we would play this game called Antakshri, Antakshri. And Antakshri is when you sing a song, a Hollywood, Bollywood song, but you start with the last sound of the last set, a last song. So if it ended in ooh, your next song has to start with ooh. And, and uh, you know, I mean, like I was immersed in the culture. I grew up with my, with my family, my cousins. Uh, I never saw myself as not belonging. In fact, I thought I belonged. Um, until my cousins would make comments like, you don't know how to sing properly. You don't sound like us. And it's like, I know the words better than you. I practice this more. I, you know, I sing it without any hitches, but no, I wasn't like them. It was the same thing with dancing in the community. It was the same thing with everything. And so, so they made me conscious because even though I felt like I belonged, they started having judgments about you know, I don't sound like them. I'm not, you know, I don't look like them. I don't, whatever. And it, it grew as we grew. There was a lot more of this comparing one to another. And the fact that I had a white father, just, you know, even though I didn't look white in, in most ways, like it still impacted that sense of belonging in the home. And then I noticed that when we moved to England, because we moved to England when I was eight, uh, and then I was introduced to my father's white family and his, you know, white brother and kids and his sister and their, their white kids. Like, like you could have any white person walk by me and it's like me just pointing at someone and saying, that's my older sister and she's 40 years older than me. It was, it was such a random thing to say, these people are your family. And they, you know, they've had a history with my dad who's now 94, uh, who, you know, very, very interesting background and story. But I remember when they would, you know, we would sit at dinner getting to know the families and then they would look at me and say, yeah, like we don't see dad in you. And it, it hurt me so much that I would sit there and literally look at my body 
and be like, are my fingernails like my dad's? Are my toenails like my dad's? Like, do my shin bones look like my dad's? Like, I was desperate to see something of my father in me. And it, 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 it was really painful to go through that process of, of trying to find, uh, you know, some space in between these two cultures and these two backgrounds that were so brown and so white. And ultimately the same thing happened with the context of Africa where people always said, you're not enough. It, almost like you're not, not, not only are you not enough, but you're not even good enough when you make the effort. And um, that was really, really painful for me for a long time until I said, fuck it, I am who I am. And what I am is actually bigger than just this and just that, right? Like that box is not going to work for me because I'm that plus, 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 plus. And so, you know, now the way I experience it is I travel all over the world. I have a global career. You can put me in any country, any context, any situation, and I belong. And the reason why I can, I have that cultural fluidity is because I've developed the competence to belong in any setting. And you don't get to decide whether I belong or not, because I've already decided that I belong. <laughs> but yeah. Um, sorry, sorry for the bad language. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> Started with badass, so we're just going from okay, there. Okay, right. <laughs> um, how did your parents navigate some of those situations? Were they aware that those comments were being made to you? Did they were they able to offer any advice or help kind of bolster your self worth and recognizing that you were struggling with some of those pieces? Well, uh, as I said, in the, there were times when I was living with my extended family and not with my parents. And there were times when I was living in boarding school and I didn't have access to them on a day-to-day -day basis. So it was difficult to get that solid grounding that a lot of people get when they're with their parents day in and day out. But one thing that I knew about both my parents were they had both, and I, I've said this in a different uh, context, I've said my parents were both rebels. Like my father live, lived in England in a little village where the expectation of life was that you grow up, you marry your first girlfriend and you own a bike and you have a job, the same job for the rest of your life. And he left all of that because he decided that there must be more to life. And he took the biggest risk anyone in his family had ever taken to move to Africa, this concept of Africa, not knowing what that would be. So he, he was a rebel. He broke free and decided there was more to life and went looking for it. And the same thing with my mother. She was married to an Indian guy. He tried to kill her, you know, for, for the money and try, you know, her mother, uh, his mother tried to beat her up and tell her she couldn't be as independent as she was when she was growing up in her own family. And she was the first woman in the South Asian community in East Africa to not only leave her husband, but then to marry a white guy of all people. And she got beaten up for it and she got called names for it. So I, I was already in this culture and I knew their story from a young age. In fact, my mother had mental health issues as a result of all that she had been through and, and the physical and emotional and psychological trauma. So I lived, I lived all of that difficulty. And I think it was just, it was, what I absorbed from them is Nobody gets to tell my story. Nobody gets to decide how this ends. I decide. And so as a young person, it was hard to get to that point because I didn't have them around. But, you know, I also learned so much from them around resiliency and around, you know, not letting someone else decide your future and independence and all of that. So they've, sh they've shaped a lot of my perspective on social justice, inclusion. Like, it's, Im it's impossible for a brown woman who grew up in the context my mother did to accept and not only accept but adopt and bring into her home a black kid that her husband had with somebody else. Like that, that was a no-no on so many levels. And my mother taught me that compassion and forgiveness is the only way to go. So yeah, they helped me a lot with much of this. Compassion and forgiveness are the only way to go. I love that. That's a fantastic uh, quote from your mom and tribute to your mom. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit, Karen, around sort of how psychological safety comes into play with you in creating belonging. I mean, as you talked about, you travel globally, you work across different cultures. How do you bring psychological safety to life? How do you kind of create places and spaces where people feel like they can show up and belong? Well, you know, as, as you can see from just a few things I've told you about my life, there's some pretty hard edges and some very painful moments. And when we're doing this work with other people, you know, the only way to do this work in a powerful way is to be honest, to, to bring that vulnerability and honesty to your engagement with yourself and with others. And to do that, 
you as a facilitator, as a trainer, have to be skilled in creating safety for people. And so we create ground rules, uh, and I don't just come and impose them. We co-create them together. We agree on you know, what people are willing to do and wh where they're supposed to go or want to go. So for example, in one setting, uh, the group asked that we ask for permission before we share anything traumatizing with each other. So let's just ask people permission if they're willing to even have that conversation. So we co-create the rules, but also we plan for it in advance when we know it's going to be around um, you know, something as traumatic as my early experience as a teenager. And we give numbers, we have uh, people next, next door in another room who are willing to uh, help you if you're triggered or if something comes up. So I think it's about planning for and taking seriously that this won't always go one way when people start to deal with this information and, and really unfold their stories. And I think the other thing is to just be really loving. Like, I don't think we're very comfortable hugging each other. You know, we're not comfortable reaching out and just showing love to one another. And so if you can create a space where you give each other the permission to, to not only say, I hear you and I understand you, but can I come over and give you a hug? Can I hold you in your pain right now and just acknowledge that you are doing the work to heal, right? So all of these pieces are, are very much a part of how I work, um, regardless of the context. And, and sometimes it requires telling somebody, you know, this is not your time. Like you're clearly not ready and you're not helping other people on their journey. So you have a choice to make. Either you stay in the conversation and do the work with us or you leave. And it's okay to choose to leave. You know, that's, that's the badass part is knowing when you need to ask somebody to make that decision and, and get off the fence because the rest of us have done the work to get off the fence, right? That's a fantastic answer. Thank you for that. Um, David, I'm going to pivot to you because earlier in the conversation, you brought up, you know, students sort of being afraid to um, say something because they're afraid of saying the wrong thing. So kind of circling back to the question I asked Karen around, how do you kind of create the safety and the opportunity for people to show up to um, uh, under, or open the space for what they don't know and um, to also be able to sort of ask some of the questions and to express themselves without sort of fear of doing or saying the wrong thing. I'm not sure I, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm an expert to, to talk about what people should do. I mean, I, I can talk about my own struggles and, uh, you know, some of the own cha my own challenges that I've, you know, tried to circumnavigate it. It's, it's tricky. Um, you know, as, as an example, uh, at Mount Royal, we are cognizant and recognize that a significant number of our students are likely, you know, to put a, a title on it, LGBTQ. Um, and it's not something I know a lot about. Um, and so, you know, I made a, an effort to, you know, to kind of become more aware. And I think self-awareness and a willingness to learn is perhaps, you know, the, the biggest, the most important part from my, my perspective. I, you know, I, and it was little things like I put, I put two flags outside of my office uh, to demonstrate that it was a safe place um, for people from LGBTQ uh, communities. And there were about, I don't know, five or six faculty members in a department of 20 that chose to do that. Um, and somebody asked me why I did it. I'm like, oh, I, I guess, you know, if there's a student of mine who is LGBTQ and hasn't divulged that to me or, um, you know, wants to feel comfortable knowing that I'm comfortable with it, then that's, that's enough. Like that, that to me was that made it worthwhile and if and I don't know if that's you know the end all and be all by sticking a flag outside your office and um, you know I'm not I'm not pretending that I've kind of solved all the world's issues by simply doing that but I guess it was a step like we've spent a lot of time on campus trying to talk about you know even the terminology that we're using the decolonization or the indigenization of our curriculums and I think part of it again is just going through the process of self-awareness and a real understanding of like, what do we talk about even in our curriculum? And so as, you know, as chair of the department, we went through a process where everybody was asked to really dive deep into the examples that they use in their, when they're doing a case study in their biomechanics class, like what type of person do they use? And apparently we do a very, very good job of high performance, um, able-bodied, 
20 to 30 year olds. Like we've got that nailed. Um, and I would suspect for the most part, Caucasian. Um, and I don't think that was purposeful. I don't think that was a systematic decision that we made. Um, it just happened. It just kind of slowly evolved because we never, we didn't check it. We never asked the question. We never said, well, maybe, maybe we shouldn't be doing that. Um, and so again, I think it's just, you know, and as I'm getting older and, uh, I think I'm just becoming a bit more reflective on, you know, why do I think the way I think and why do I teach the way I teach? And I'm just challenging some of those assumptions and, uh, questioning some of the, what are my go-tos? What are my automatics that I just align myself with without really giving it a whole lot of thought? So I think just that, that questioning, the self-assessment and the self-awareness is probably the, the biggest uh, part of, of ensuring that we're not, or ensuring that we are trying to enable as much belonging as possible. What I'm not even sure. I can't even remember what your question was. I just started <laughs> blathering on. One of the things I've always really appreciated, David, about you is how you kind of bring people in, whether it was at a, around a boardroom table where you'd sort of call people out to ask for their input on a decision or a discussion, or, you know, with your students, you're kind of constantly promoting their success and what they're doing and um, inviting them to connect with others in sort of your broader community so that uh, they have sort of a network, a built in network, courtesy of David Legg, if you will, um, which I think is a really valuable and important piece in terms of building belonging connection to where they're going to go on their journey. So, you know, kudos to you and that. And that's one of the pieces I've always really respected about your approach. Well, thanks. You're welcome. So I did ask people to post questions in the chat box. I'm also willing to unmute people if they've got questions. Um, so Mark's put a question in the chat box. How do we intentionally get others in more leadership positions to do more of that self-assessment, awareness, and questioning so they don't only see the bias they bring but continue to explore more about others' realities? And I think maybe I'll get Karen to kick off with this since uh, we uh, haven't heard from you in just a little while. Oh man, I was hoping <laughs> that I wouldn't be first. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Did you go answer? <laughs> David, do you uh, want to go first? Yeah, I, I'm happy to. I, well, I would probably repeat one of the answers I gave earlier, and it's the, it's the modeling. Uh, it's the practicing what you preach. And so, you know, if I want my colleagues to question how we do things and to, you know, challenge the status quo, I better, I better be willing to do it myself. And in some respects, maybe even asking people to take on leadership roles in leading some of that change, which is not easy to do because you have to, like you have to give up, you have to give away some power. Um, and you have to trust that the process is going to unfold, perhaps not exactly as you would like it to, or, you know, in the same, you know, speed or pace or, but I, I think you, you do, you need to give away, um, some power to encourage others to take on responsibility. I, but again, it's, it's like, it's not, it's clearly not an easy, easy thing to do. Otherwise, Mark wouldn't be asking the question, um, cause we would just be doing it. Uh, so it's, it's tricky. It's, it's hard. People have ingrained biases and temperaments and ways of thinking that, you know, don't change easily, um, or quickly, but I do, I, yeah, I come back to, I think, I just think it's the modeling and the, the, the little bits of influence that we can have, um, here and there. And, and perhaps sometimes we don't even see the outcomes of that. Um, like I, I'm always amazed at you know, I'll teach six courses a year, 50 students in each one, let's say. So, you know, approximately 300 students a year. They're, you know, give or take. And I'm amazed that there are some who I think just think I am the biggest idiot that they've ever met. And they can't stand me. And they can't stand the course. They can't stand the content. And I'll talk or I'll run into them 10 years later and they'll say, you know, this one class, we talked about this and it had such an important impact on me and I changed the way I think about things and the influence that it's had on my career. I'm like, are you kidding me? I thought you hated my guts. Um, and they might have and they might still, but 
nonetheless, there's these little things. It's like it's the butterfly effect, right? It's the chaos theory. It's we don't know sometimes the impact that we're going to have on the modeling of the behaviors and where that plays out and who that actually influences. So I, yeah, I don't have, I don't have a quick or easy answer. That's for sure. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to have to keep our answers a little bit quick if we want to get through a second. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Karen, did you want to layer into that one? Okay. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> the question was how do we intentionally get others in leadership positions to do more self um, assessment, awareness, questioning what they do so that we can maybe move the dial forward. Well, I think it all depends on, on who you're asking. So for example, I'm often brought into organizations where there is either a problem or there's new leadership, or for some reason they're saying we need to get this right. And so in that context, they're bringing me in to facilitate them through a process to actually understand, okay, we're leaders, we're at the board level, you know, how do we make sure we have diversity and inclusion come to life for the board? What does it look like when we're hiring leaders, et cetera? So in that case, I've been given a specific role to play and, and they want that outcome to happen. And so there are a few things that you can do around that. One is, um, you know, to have that education because there's so much you don't know. Like, I want people to understand this. Equity, diversity, and inclusion work is a real job. Like, it's a real field. It requires skills and there's education involved. It's not, people call it soft skills and they call it like this nice thing to have. No, no, no. It's fundamental to everything. And I bring that forward in development work as well, which I've been doing for the last 20 years. So if you build a school in a country, for example, and you're trying to help them with education, you need to understand that how you design that school uh, depends on who is coming to that school and what are the barriers that are affecting them. Girls may not come to the school because they have to do chores at home. Boys may not come to school because they have to go take care of the, the animals during the day. So you can't just go and show up and create a school and think everybody's gonna benefit equally. So there's in, uh, information that's needed about the communities you're working with. There's education that's required around understanding concepts and tools that you bring to the way you think and the way you design processes and programs that's a big piece and then the third piece around getting this work right is resourcing it appropriately so it's fine to go and give somebody a conscious uh, an unconscious bias training but if they don't have the resources to actually change the the forms they use or to improve the processes they have or to bring in somebody to do more work on it then you're asking them to basically become educated and then tie their hands behind their back and do nothing about it. So, you know, I think it's, it's, it's about finding a holistic approach to this work and it requires more than just having a nice feeling conversation about, you know, yeah, yeah, we had that conversation. We had that training, that person came in and left. Let's not window dress because window dressing actually does more harm than doing things right. Wow, fantastic answers from both of you. I, um, we do have additional questions in the chat box, but we're actually running a little short on time. So I'm gonna maybe ask both of you to read the question from um, Be Fit for Life Medicine Hat um, and uh, maybe respond in the chat box while I sort of wrap us up. Um, so first of all, I just really wanna acknowledge both David and Karen for your time today and for your uh, expertise and for sharing and being vulnerable with us and sort of your lived experience and your journey through belonging. Um, it's been a really rich discussion and so much uh, knowledge from both of you to share with the group today. And I'm just really, really grateful that I have you both in my network and I'm connected to you and that you're both such incredible humans that uh, I get to uh, play in the sandbox with, if you are will. Um, I do then also want to just um, uh, highlight that next week um, we have uh, Devin Haro and Diane Lloyd as our two guests. And um, Devin is uh, with the CBC, the Canadian Broadcast Corporation, as a sports reporter and has broken some really uh, uh, interesting stories over the last year around safe sport and is really passionate about you know, how do we sort of connect and make sure that people are having positive experiences. He's also an openly gay man in a sports reporting role and has been quite vocal about what that's looked like. Diane Lloyd um, runs a company called Inspired Results Group and is a life coach and does executive coaching. And um, her and I have a number of conversations around sort of 
the work she does and how inclusion, diversity, and belonging come into that. And she's also a Dare to Lead um, learning facilitator for Brené Brown's program. So really excited about that. Want to um, close off by again just thanking Karen and David so much for being here today and to our audience for joining us and for the great questions. I'm sorry we ran out of time. I'll have to structure things so we um, start questions a little bit earlier because I have a feeling we will always run out of time. But um, yeah, it was great to have folks here today and um, I look forward to our next conversations.